So heart-related issues. Um, so the main thing that I often see with patients, either sooner or later, usually it's later, is something called orthostatic hypotension. That means low blood pressure. And it means low blood pressure when mostly you're standing up. But in fact, a lot of patients with Parkinson's will have low, low blood pressure at baseline. And then when you stand up, the blood pressure gets even lower. Um, that can be a problem because if you don't have blood circulating to the brain because your blood pressure is too low, you get woozy, you get fatigued, you feel like you're going to pass out. Some people actually do pass out. So that, obviously that's a big issue. Um, sometimes you can get heart rate variability issues where the, the heart rate doesn't compensate like it's supposed to. So if you're running up a flight of stairs, so the heart rate doesn't compensate and increase to, to push that blood to the brain and the, and the uh, muscles to get you up the stairs. Uh, sometimes, not often, but sometimes you can have heart-related uh, dysrhythmias, so you have irregular heartbeat. <clears throat> So with orthostatic hypotension, like I just explained, it's low blood pressure when you're standing up. Um, it causes lightheadedness and dizziness. So sometimes people will kind of mistake this sort of symptom just for feeling dizzy, like they, they may mistake it as maybe it's an inner ear issue, but in reality, no, it's, it's low blood pressure. Um, so it's something that we should be checking when you're here in the office. Um, your primary doctor should do it, but um, I usually try to make a point to check that sort of thing when you're at my office, checking your sitting blood pressure and your standing blood pressure. Um, if there is a big drop between the two when you're standing, then we know there's a problem. Um, there's something called coat hanger syndrome. Uh, which actually is part of orthostatic hypotension in some people. So um, if, if the orthostatic hypotension is there and then suddenly or not so suddenly maybe, you know, you're getting this gradual pain across the shoulders or in the neck every time you stand up, you know, some people will say, well, it's arthritis, it must be arthritis. But sometimes it's because of the low blood pressure because the blood pressure is not getting to that area of the body um, and then you get pain in the muscles because it's not seeing blood supply. Um, and then aside from orthostatic hypotension, the opposite can actually happen for some people called supine hypertension. So you stand up, you have low blood pressure. You lay down and all of a sudden your blood pressure is too high. Um, we wouldn't necessarily know these things unless the blood pressure is measured, but it's something to be aware of. <clears throat> so solutions to orthostatic hypotension. Um, I'm probably one of the only physicians that will say to use salt in your diet. Um, we're also used to, you know, avoiding salt in cooking, avoiding salt after cooking in food. Um, but when I see that a patient has low blood pressure, orthostatic hypotension, First thing, easiest thing to do is get the salt shaker out. Put it on the table, start using it, use salt with cooking. Um, if that doesn't work and you're trying to get uh, enough fluids in because you do have to drink water, more water than you think, most of us don't drink enough water anyway, um, then we might have to be resorted to yet another pill. And I really try not to add more pills to your regimen the pill burden just gets so overwhelming at times. Um, but there are pills to help with blood pressure. It's better to take a pill than it is to pass out in public somewhere because your blood pressure is low. Um, so we have a few options with that. Um, even caffeine can be helpful to boost the blood pressure. Um, and then in the morning time, before you even get out of bed, one thing you're going to want to do, especially if you know you have low blood pressure and this is an issue, you want to try and sit up on the side of the bed or just to at least incline to at least 30 degrees because what this is going to do is it's going to activate a system in your kidneys that's going to promote and support blood pressure. It's going to raise your blood pressure. Um, so you can't just go from laying completely flat and then jump out of bed and expect to be okay because that's probably not going to work out. Um, and then, aside from pills, aside from salt, you can also use compression stockings on the legs. Helps with low blood pressure. Um, so you can get these over the counter. You can also ask for a prescription for these things. Uh, it's best to have the kind that come up to the thighs. 
uh, as opposed to the ones you can commonly see ones that come to the knees, but it's better to get the kind that come to the thighs. Those are uh, more effective. Um, so, not only is there low blood pressure when you're standing up, but sometimes there's just low blood pressure after you eat. So if anybody has ever experienced you know, that maybe they feel a little dizzy afterwards, or maybe it's the food they ate and they're not, they're not, they have to go lay down because they don't feel so well. So sometimes this can be because the blood pressure gets lower, um, because you've just eaten a meal, and the blood is going to the stomach to try and help with, um, you know, processing the food, and in the meantime, the rest of your body is not getting the blood that it needs. So this is called postprandial hypotension. Um, you can try and mitigate this a little bit by choosing certain types of food. Um, um, carbohydrates are pretty well tolerated. Uh, things with, that are heavy in fats a little bit harder to, to digest. Um, but if you know this might happen, um, or you've experienced it and you've figured it out, this is what's happening, you know, one thing you can do is uh, drink a really uh, very ice cold, tall glass of water. Um, before the meal, because that will help with the blood pressure. You could also have caffeine or coffee before the meal as well, because that will help as well. So, <clears throat> heart arrhythmias. So this means that the heart rate becomes irregular. Um, so if you notice, you know, every once in a while, you get like a little flutter in your heart, or you feel that um, the 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 heart's just every once in a while skipping a beat. Uh, it's definitely something to bring up to the any physician, primary care physician, neurologist. Um, so we can do an EKG. Sometimes there's a, a halter monitor where you can wear a device for a few days and see if we can catch something there. Uh, sometimes there is more long-term monitoring, uh, but it's definitely something we want to check out. Doesn't happen often, but it's something to know about. So moving on, moving on down the body, GI. Um, okay, so I think probably one of the most common problems that I see with Parkinson's patients uh, would be swallowing issues. I always ask about, you know, how is swallowing when you're in at the clinic? Um, because that can become an issue. And the reason uh, it becomes an issue is because of the synergy. The muscles with the swallowing just are not working together. Uh, and for that same reason, you can also get drooling, too. Um, of course, constipation, I think, is a, a big issue in almost all Parkinson's patients. Not 100%, not but almost all. Uh, sometimes you can get some difficulty with the stomach emptying, so people will also have nausea because of that, and sometimes regurgitation. So with the swallowing, um, so basically what happens with swallowing with Parkinson's uh, you have voluntary muscles, mostly the tongue muscles uh, that help with uh, chewing, getting the food back to the back of the throat to help with the initiating the swallowing mechanism. And then after that, what takes over is involuntary muscles that help swallow the food down the esophagus. And so if your muscles already are not working well because you have Parkinson's, getting those two, two uh, systems working together is even more difficult and so people will have choking, uh, they may cough with meals or maybe with certain types of fluids, maybe thin liquids, but you're okay with shakes. So something to, to really think about. Um, sometimes this, this can be mitigated by adjusting medication. So, um, and um, if, if not, or if we're really concerned that with every meal you might be, you know, inhaling something going down the wrong pipe, you have to get a swallow study, um, and then uh, speech therapy will help too, so they can actually teach you, you know, foods that you shouldn't be eating, foods that you can safely eat. Um, they may they advise you on consistency of foods. Sometimes you'll have to actually um, maybe spoon your coffee instead of drink your coffee because it has to be thickened. Um, so, and the, the, I guess the worst case scenario is if swallowing is just not going to happen. Um, safely, then you're at the risk of uh, taking food in and then it going down the, the trachea and having aspiration pneumonia. Um, so 
So and that's certainly the worst case scenario, and some people will choose to have a feeding tube if they cannot get enough calories in to support their, their weight. Um, but that's not, not a common choice, but still, you know, that, that may happen. Sialuria means drooling. Um, so drooling happens for a couple of reasons. Sometimes, you know, it's not um, always there. Sometimes it seems to be related to timing of medication. Uh, with Parkinson's medicine, the drooling does get uh, temporarily better, um, but uh, sometimes not completely better. And um, so with Parkinson's, we're not swallowing uh, even at a, a base rate. We all kind of swallow um, inadvertently, you know, we're unconscious of this, this swallowing, automatic swallowing mechanism, but with Parkinson's we don't do that as much. Um, so then the, the saliva builds up. Um, so aside from Parkinson's medication, we do have other options that can address sialuria or drooling. Some of them are oral medications. Um, there's also um, Botox or botulinum injections that sometimes helps. Um, so, if this is a big issue, especially when it is creating other swallowing issues, it definitely would need to be addressed with your doctor. Constipation. Very common. Uh, can be very problematic. And I would say, you know, it's due to a couple of different issues that are combined. One is that not drinking enough water, especially in the winter time, nobody's drinking enough water. But as we get older, you know, sometimes purposely people will not drink enough water because that means they don't have to go to the bathroom 20 times in an hour. Um, but on the other hand, it's also harmful because you're not getting enough water in. Um, so not only that, so you have lack of water. Also, the, the GI system itself slows down. Uh, so when the colon slows down, uh, the colon, is its main purpose is to remove water. Um, when that slows down, there's, uh, there's, there's too much time for the water to be absorbed. It gets absorbed very well into the body, um, and then therefore you have constipation. So aside from drinking more water, things that can help with constipation would be change in diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, roughage, um, whole grains, and then you can go to the over-the-counter options. Um, so there's things like Metamucil that just kind of package up the stool basically and then um, get things flowing that way. There's also a, a stool softeners that just kind of make things a little bit oily and things move down the, uh, the, the pipeline smoothly. And there's laxatives that are kind of um, uh, like an irritant. It creates water in your, in your colon. And then, and then there's medications. Like prescription medications that most people, we don't, we don't generally go towards that. Um, so aside from what I've mentioned, um, if somebody is brave enough to, to offer their um, things that work for them, because this is always something that's, this is always trial and error. Um, you know, I always say, well, try this, try that, try that. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, sometimes you're left to your own devices. Um, so does anybody have any options aside from what I said that they found has really been helpful? Yes? Yes, magnesium can help. So there's milk of magnesia, so it, it does help to pull the, the water in into the colon. Um, yeah, so that's helpful. Anybody else? Yes. Cereals. Cereals. So grains. kinds of bran cereals. Mm -hmm. That helps for some people. Um, so, but it's just, like I said, it's a matter of trial and error. Finding something that's going to be helpful for your particular body. Yes. I use Miralax and I put it in Bi, which is a flavored drink mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't have a lot of other cook in it. And it works really easy. So Miralax in a flavored drink. Yeah, um, Miralax is one of those things that I often will recommend um, if it's something that you know you've tried all the other natural things or over the counter things. Miralax is also over the counter, uh, but it's a little bit stronger than most. Um, but it is something that we may may have to use. Sleep issues. Okay, so I'm sure um, everybody is able 
and they have very good sleep in this room. I'm sure she's perfect. Um, so there can be lots of different varieties of sleep issues. Um, first of all, there's insomnia. Um, that can just kind of go with, with age. As we get older, we're sleeping less anyway. Our body just doesn't need as much sleep. Um, but it's still frustrating because you want to go to sleep and you can't. Um, there's something called parasomnias, uh, which doesn't often happen with, with Parkinson's patients. Um, but then there's something called REM behavior disorder, um, which is basically um, somebody who has this is basically acting out their dreams physically. Um, and it can get pretty dramatic sometimes and dangerous. Um, so it's definitely something that has to be addressed. It's something that I always ask about. And then there's restless leg syndrome. Um, which can be, it's like a form of torture, I think, restless leg syndrome. Um, sleep apnea can sometimes be there in the mix. Um, and then there's excessive daytime sleepiness. And is that because you couldn't sleep the night before, or is that because the Parkinson's in the daytime is, is giving you this excessive sleepiness? Is it the medication? Sometimes it's all of the above. Uh, so basically, so the reason that we get uh, problems with sleep is because of those darn movie bodies that affect the brain. Uh, they affect certain areas um, in the brain stem, and um, that's then going to affect the sleep. So aside from some of those things, also what happens with Parkinson's patients is, you know, most of the time you're taking your medicine during the daytime when you're active, but you may not be taking any at night or before you go to sleep, and then you can get Parkinson's symptoms that kind of creep into your sleep and then wake you up. Um, so that's also something that uh, we need to consider. So REM behavior disorder. Um, so the reason you know we need to really address this is because this can sometimes be dangerous. Um, you know, you're acting out your dreams at night, and if that's all that happens, fine. But then if you start hitting your neighbor because you're you know punching the villain in your dream, of course somebody's going to get hurt. Um, you can also fall out of bed, and you know if you have a nightstand next to you and you hit the side of your bed, hit the side of your head, the nightstand, you get a big gash, and it's just going to be blood everywhere. Scalp wounds, bleed like nothing. Um, so it needs to be addressed. It's something that we can address fairly easily for the most part. Um, it's interesting that uh, REM behavior disorder can precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's by multiple years. Um, so it would be, uh, you know, interesting if you if you notice that in yourself or you know your spouse. So the easiest treatment, the thing that I start off with the most, first off for REM behavior disorder, is something called melatonin, which you can get over the counter. Um, it's, it's a very subtle sleep aid. Our brains already make melatonin when it's time to go to bed at night. Um, but if melatonin is not enough, uh, then what we call the first line treatment would be something called clonazepam. Um, if you're able to tell me. Clonazepam is a benzodiazepine, but it, so that means that it's, um, it can be very sedating for some people, uh, which is a concern if you're getting up in the middle of the night and you already have some imbalance. Um, that's something you might use though. Also, Parkinson's, just the Parkinson's medications may help with REM behavior disorder. So restless leg syndrome, again, form of torture. Um, I've been on a 12-hour plane ride, and 11 of those 12 hours, my legs were just going crazy. And um, <clears throat> so this happens because there is a dysregulation of dopamine within the spinal cord. Um, we don't know much more about it than that. It can also precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's by years. Um, two times more common in Parkinson's patients than not Parkinson's patients. So things you're going to want to do to try and limit restless leg syndrome. So aside from taking your medication that's been prescribed for it, um, you do want to limit your caffeine in the evening time. Um, also, uh, you may not be aware, but sometimes over-the-counter medications and certain medications we're giving you for other reasons can contribute to restless leg syndrome. Um, so you'd want to check it out with your doctor. Um, one thing we do know is that if you have restless leg syndrome and we're having a hard time treating it, um, we have to check your iron level in the form of what we call ferritin, um, because if your ferritin is low, um, we say less than 50, 
um, then it's really hard to get any sort of uh, leverage or leeway with the restless leg syndrome. Just so you know, if your primary doctor checks your ferritin level and they say it's normal, that doesn't necessarily mean it's above 50. It just may mean normal for their range that they have, but it has to be above 50. Um, <clears throat> Benadryl is another thing that can contribute to restless leg syndrome. Sometimes you take that at night because you want to get to sleep, but it may also be working against you. <coughs> Has anybody ever tried the ivory soap technique? Ever heard of that? What is it? Apparently, you put a bar of ivory soap underneath your sheets, <laughs> and it helps with restless leg syndrome. I actually did try it. Um, I think it's basically, you know, psychosomatic. Um, <laughs> it might work. <laughs> okay, so daytime sleepiness and fatigue. This is really a tough one. I have a really hard time trying to um, address this. Um, so oftentimes it's medication related. So we're giving you medicines that's causing you to be sleepy, but we're treating the Parkinson symptoms at the same time. Um, some medications, especially dopamine agonists, so that would be things like ropinerol, gramopexil, and nupro, um, those can cause sleep attacks. So you're driving along, everything is fine, 10 seconds later you wake up in the middle of an uh, intersection and it's because you had a sleep attack from a medication. Definitely, definitely not a good thing. Definitely a huge safety issue. Um, so be aware of that, that that can happen. Sometimes it's not medication related. Sometimes the sleepiness is not medication related. It's just related to the Parkinson's. You struggle all day to go from point A to point B, and it takes so much energy to do so. Um, so that creates a fatigue. You're not sleeping enough at night. That creates a fatigue. Um, so you can try some things on your own, like caffeine, as long as you don't take it late at night. Um, you can, uh, you know, just getting outside, getting fresh air can kind of help wake you up. Exercising helps wake you up a little bit, even though counterintuitively it's like, I don't want to exercise, I'm too tired. Um, sleep apnea, you know, if you have that or if there's any inkling of that, you've got to get it checked out. If you're not sleeping because you have sleep apnea, um, that has other effects other than just fatigue. And then there is actually prescription medication for fatigue. So methylphenidate is an example. That's also known as Ritalin. We give it to kids who have ADHD. Um, we also give it to patients who have really difficulty with, with energy levels. Uh, there's also other forms similar to, to Ritalin. Um, so that's just an example of one. And then mood. Um, mood is a big issue. Like whether we like to think about it or not, there's, you know, I think there's some personalities uh, that may not admit to having any mood issues. Um, so, so there's that. Um, anxiety and depression is very common uh, with Parkinson's. With the lack of dopamine, you also have lack of serotonin. Serotonin is what you need to have a, a good mood and control on anxiety. Um, so you really, you know, if it's something that's really interfering with your quality of life, it's something that you really need to address. Don't be scared of it. It's just, you know, part, part of the whole package. Um, there's also psychotherapy. And then, you know, what I think happens sometimes with Parkinson's patients, especially with, with being recently diagnosed, is there's a sort of reactionary depression. You know, you're reacting to the diagnosis, which, which pulls your mood down. Um, but I, I think uh, plenty of people in this room will probably say, yes, Parkinson's disease sucks. Um, but you, you learn to live with it. You learn to navigate the troubles. Um, so we get through it. here. <laughs> so this video is supposed to be of Jimmy Choi. Has anyone heard of him? 
Yeah, a few people. So he's an interesting guy. Um, he has Parkinson's and uh, he was diagnosed in his late 20s, I think. Um, and he really didn't deal with it very well. Um, he didn't do a lot with the Parkinson's. And then one day he was going down the stairs carrying his toddler and he fell down the entire flight of stairs and he realized he needed to do something. So <clears throat> we'll see if we can get the videos to, to show. Right here, it looks it really looks good. It great on the computer. <laughs> He's doing great stuff. <laughs> I'm trying to get to and That's what I'm trying to do. Um, it's usually there's... Oh, does that work? Control. Control.
So everybody smile, smile, smiling. It actually does change your brain chemistry when you smile. Whether you want to smile or not, even if it's a fake smile, as a fake smile, still, still, it's helping. Um, it does change your brain chemistry. So every once in a while, just go around and smile, and people will be like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> I am smiling. I'm changing my brain chemistry. Good. Be thankful. Have a gratitude journal, maybe. Um, I've tried this gratitude journal, and I don't, I'm not always good at writing things down. But what's really nice about a gratitude journal is then picking it up and reading what you've written before, and then that really, it really kicks in. I was like, wow, I was really happy that day about this or that. And then it reminds you of how nice it was, and that just really kicks up your mood. Um, join a support group, of course. Um, you know, I think there's some people who fear uh, joining a support group because they say, well, I don't want to see what I'm going to become. Or, you know, I'm not that bad. I don't need to go to the support group. Um, but really, I mean, you learn from each other. Um, there's been, there's somebody in that support group who has had the experience that they can give you that's going to help you and vice versa. Um, definitely uh, recommend that. And then volunteering. If you have the time, and you can do it, volunteer. Um, it, it really just you know, boosts your, your well-being, you feel good about yourself, you're helping others. Um, my friend likes to say, I think we were talking about one of the tragedies that happened. I can't remember which one it was, we have some money, but when there is darkness, be the light. Spend time with your family. Um, one thing I wish that my grandparents did was, was write about their family because I know nothing about them. I know nothing about my, my relatives beyond my grandparents. And both of my parents were gone, my grandparents were gone. So write it down because it's helpful for the generations to come. Spread your wisdom, share what you've learned. Next <coughs> video. So she was just talking about how it might affect her. Um, she said it affects mostly her legs, but if it ever affected her hands, she would just switch to the messy type of art. <laughs> but she has a, a good attitude. Ah, so this, uh, this is a quilt that one of my patients made. Um, I think it's awesome. And she's in the audience today. Hey, you want to say hello? Right over there. So I think it's amazing, it's beautiful. It says, when the harsh wind blows, bend and adapt with determination. With faith, you will have strength to be hopeful and endure. It's called resilience. Another quilt she made. Um, hope. Hiking in the Buttes in South Dakota, you will see Indian prayer ties. A pinch of tobacco, a sacred herb, is folded into a square of cloth and tied to a tree as an offering of gratitude. So each of those colors represents something uh, those ties represent. So red is thanks, yellow is healing, blue is Father Sky, green is Mother Earth, white is guidance, and black is reflection. With prayer comes hope. I think it's beautiful. So another round. and encouraging quotes. Um, the top one here is my favorite. We say it all the time, especially um, in medicine. The perfect is the enemy of good because there really is no such thing as perfect. And you try and strive for perfect and you bypass the good or good enough. Um, I like Helen Keller's uh, quote, I long to accomplish a great and noble task. But it is my chief duty to accomplish small tasks as if they were great and noble. So even small things count. You don't have to go for the grandiose idea of small things. That's what matters. 
Uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So this is a game actually one of my patients made. He handmade this. Handmade the marbles. He handmade the board. On the other side is another game. He also created the rules. Something that he likes to do in his free time. So another example of staying busy um, despite Parkinson's disease. Um, this is these are uh, landscape architect plans. This is what he does. This is all hand drawn, and he has Parkinson's, and um, he doesn't he doesn't let it interfere with what he wants to do. So exercise, exercise, exercise. exercise. Um, walking, I always say walking 30 minutes a day. That would be great. If you did that, that would be great. Um, if you can't do that, find other forms of exercise. There's the boxing classes. Who does the boxing? So a couple people. Boxing apparently is very fun. Do you do boxing? Yes. So uh, it's a good group. Um, so anything else? Anybody else have a favorite sport they do? Um, Dancing. Dancing. Yes. Yoga. Yoga. Moving to music. Moving to music. Yep. Tennis. Tennis. Yes, I have tennis players. Anything else? Pickleball. What is that? Pickleball. Oh, pickleball. My kids play that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> with, a, with a ball. And, yeah. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go, video. We're going to try this again. <laughs> this is the video you've all heard. Still no. No. Seriously. Riding a trike. A trike? Instead of a bike. Yeah. Let's see. Bike. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Dr. Gaines, if you could repeat the question because it may yes. not be, some so folks may not have heard. The question is, what's the best way to go about getting yourself a neurologist that isn't going to um, sort of fight against you or maybe is the best fit personality-wise? Um, so one thing you would do is, of course, you need a referral from your primary care doctor who should know your personality um, and um, who probably knows the the local you know, Parkinson specialist. Um, so you would talk with them or her about you know, what do you think would be a good fit. And sometimes it is kind of trial and error. You find one and you thought they might be good, but maybe it's not a good fit. And so you, know, you, you try others. Um, there's a handful of us in the Milwaukee area, um, less so, of course, in the surrounding areas. Um, but basically, you know, that's what you, you have to work with. Yes, question in the back. Uh, last, last fall, I participated in a 5K walk in Miller Park. Mm -hmm. And about three quarters of the street of my 5K walk, I started listening to the left side. I could barely walk. And I had to have my wife and daughter help me. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what, what causes that and your body starts to listen to the left. Yeah. Um, so, you probably, you know, were having some wearing off your medicine, I would think. Um, so people feel like, especially if they're really, really active, they feel like they're kind of burning through their medicine quicker. Um, and so in those situations, sometimes you can have like a rescue dose of medicine that you can take that gives you another oomph. Uh, that's was probably what was happening is you were experiencing wearing off. Uh, we have time for just one more question. But as Jeremy said, there's cards on the table. We're going to try to turn your back. Yeah, go go them out. We're going to try to address those in future news or or maybe. Okay. So last question. Um, I've got a kind of uh, <coughs> like the focus on genetic testing or genetic approach. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Um. So what do you mean by genetic genetic <laughs> testing or genetic treatment? because um, unless the family really, really wants to know, you know what, what's in the future for um, you know, relatives down the line, the treatment is still the treatment. We, we don't have anything different based on um, you know, the genetic testing results, although you will know that um, with genetic testing, you might be more prone to other things aside from Parkinson's symptoms, uh, certain types of malignancies and whatnot. Um, but I don't do a lot of genetic testing. It can be done. It's really expensive and insurance doesn't like to pay for it. Thank you, Dr. Gaines.